There's a story of a young Midwest country boy from the 19th century who had never seen a circus. So when he heard that one was coming to a nearby town, he just had to go. He approached his father, Pa, this is the 19th century here, Pa, can I go to the circus on Saturday? Although the family was poor, the father knew how important it was to his son just by the manner in which he was approached. He told, those la- he told the lad, get your Saturday chores done ahead of time. I'll see to it that you have some money so that you can go. Come Saturday morning, the chores completed. The young boy stood by the breakfast table with a huge anticipatory smile. His father reached into his overalls and pulled out a dollar bill. It was the most money that this youngster had had in his little hand uh, ever. The boy was so excited, his feet hardly touched the ground all the way to this town. And on the outskirts there, he noticed people were lining the streets. He followed suit and soon discovered it was the approaching spectacle of a parade. And it was impressive, especially to this young lad. Impressive that there were circus performers parading through town in hopes of stirring interest in the folks so that they might come later that afternoon to go see the circus under the big top. Animals snarled in a couple of cages. Acrobats did tumbling. Flags and ribbons were swirling uh, overhead. Bringing up the rear was the traditional circus clown. Floppy shoes, baggy pants, a brightly painted face. As the clown passed by, the little boy reached his pocket. He took out his precious dollar bill and he handed the money to the clown. The boy turned around and then made his three-mile trek back home. Why do such a thing? Well, the boy thought what he saw was the circus, but all that he had seen was just the pre-circus parade. Changing metaphors, which is something you're not supposed to do, I've been told, I'm doing it anyway. He watched the trailer to the movie thinking that was the entire show. A few weeks back in John 1, 11, we read that Jesus came to his own, a reference to the Jewish people, but his own people did not receive him. For the Jew of the day, Moses and the prophets were the circus, when in fact, they were just the parade. Moses and the prophets were the trailer to the movie. They pointed ahead to the coming real show, to the coming of the Savior of the world, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christ, the one in whom Moses and the prophets pointed to. That was their job, and that's what they did. The sin of many Jews was and is to see the parade and then go home. They never made it to the circus. They never saw the full movie that was Jesus. The sin of many Christians is different, tremendously so, for as Christians, we make it to the circus. We believe Moses and the prophets, that they pointed to Jesus and that he was and is the promised Messiah. We are saved and praise God for that. But we often fall, fail to behold the wonder of it all. That is Jesus. The wonder of it all that is Jesus. And quite frankly, our lives can look like it. We are content with our glimpse of Jesus, albeit a saving glimpse, but not one that fills us with amazement, with wonder, with awe. Our faith is orthodox, but we are easily discouraged. We appreciate the scriptures, but our understanding of them is juvenile. This morning's text gives us more reasons, however, to have an inspired faith, let's call it. That the scriptures are rich, that they are deep, and that they point to Jesus in stunning and profound ways. Our text, like many in the Gospel of John, will be a familiar one to you. But I hope we see from it that there is more to the narrative than we have seen before. May each of us see that Jesus, his gospel, and the Bible are subjects we will never, ever be able to say, I have mastered them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the text. 
Again, a familiar one to many here. May familiarity, however, not breed some sort of I can tune out. May that never be the case when the word of God is before us. Father, what do you have for us this day? We look forward to it now. We ask that your Holy Spirit would move and work. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 2 now, after we have taken a two-week hiatus away from John with Easter and then uh, with Pastor Henry preaching last Sunday, we return to John. We now are in John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Now this The first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. We read on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Verse 1, on the third day from what? Well, three days after Jesus had gained two more disciples, Philip and Nathaniel. He's now in Cana, which is in Galilee, where Jesus uh, spent the majority of his three-year public ministry. Jesus has six disciples at this point, we believe, Andrew, John, Peter, James, Philip, and Nathaniel. They are all attending a wedding. We also read that Mary is there, Jesus' mother, indicating that Canaan was probably close to the town uh, where she lived and where Jesus grew up, that, of course, being Nazareth. Now, while at the wedding, the wine begins to run short. In fact, they run out. This is not good. A Jewish wedding celebration could last a week, and it was the bridegroom's responsibility to provide the wine. Not a good look to run out of wine. Now, Mary, more than anyone present, knew who Jesus was and the task assigned to him. Luke records what Mary was told that glorious day that the angel Gabriel revealed to her. This out of Luke chapter 1. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, at his birth, when the shepherds arrive, they no doubt also told Mary what they had been told. These, this out of Luke 2. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And then, at his circumcision, eight days later, Mary heard this from Simeon. And then Anna, they said of her boy, this prophetically now from Simeon, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. That too is also in Luke 2. So Mary, we don't know exactly all that she understood, all that she knew, but she certainly had enough information. She knows who Jesus is. Was she impatient? Was she hoping that Jesus, now 30 years old, would get to the business of, quote, saving? She mentions the situation, the need. The hint, though, is clear enough that Mary expected a miracle seems certain. Woman, Jesus responds in verse 4, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. 
Now, this was no disrespect. It's the opposite. In fact, it was a respectful way to address a woman within the culture of the day. But Jesus answers Mary's request not because she is his mother, but as part of his work as Messiah. And as my Bible study, or as my, my study Bible notes reminds, I take this from those notes, this indicates that Mary's special role as Jesus' mother gives her no authority to intervene in Christ's messianic career, a strong argument against offering prayers to Mary. Now, regarding my hour has not yet come, Jesus is informing Mary that whether she knew it or not, she was intruding into matters that were entirely beyond her, above her pay grade, if you will. Jesus was on a mission, his mission. He was accomplishing a task entrusted to him by his father. Every detail of that task was eternally decreed. The task of saving God's children, by name I might add, would proceed on that divine timeline. No one else would or could change that. Now her request to the servants comes in verse 5. Do whatever he tells you. Now meaning she heard what Jesus said to her. She submitted. Maybe his time was now. Maybe it wasn't. Therefore, do whatever he says, she tells the servants. Now, there were six stone water jars present. John tells us they are, quote, there for the Jewish rites of purification. And then he gives us the information that they held between 20 and 30 gallons uh, each. That's in verse 6. What were these? Well, Mark 7 is helpful. There Jesus is having, let's call it a discussion with some scribes. And Pharisees, a disagreement, really. They were just they were upset that Jesus' disciples were observed not washing their hands and thereby not, quote, holding to the tradition of the elders. That's in Mark 7 3. What is this about? Well, in Exodus chapter 30, the law said that priests were to wash their hands just prior to a temple sacrifice. Now the Pharisees believed that in addition to the written word given, call it the law, given to Moses, there were also, through the centuries, oral laws. Oral laws that got passed down from the high priest and the priests that would come along and, for, and they would sadly hold the same weight as the written word of God. In, in, in many cases, actually, they would override the written word of God. Not a good idea. Man's interpretation should never rise to such a level. You're going to get problems. They had problems. Jesus consistently appealed to the scriptures and argued against their many traditions of man. And this is what we have here. In fact, the law of Exodus 30, which was given just to priests to do before performing their temple responsibilities, in time, through the oral law, became a law for every Jew. Before they ate, they were to ceremonially wash as well. And that's what the stone jars were there for, to spiritually, if you will, and I'm putting air quotes around that, to spiritually wash up. The premise behind them was wrong. God's law made no such requirement, but it became a way to express and and parade one's supposed devotion. You know, go over to the jar. Everybody's watching, and you're doing your thing, and, and now you're, well, you're spiritually clean. You're good to go. Jesus tells the servants in verse 7, fill the jars with water, and they fill them up to the brim. In other words, they go and they top them off. Six jars, let's call them 25 gallons each. That would be a total of 150 gallons. Now, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. Verse 8, upon tasting the water, dirty water, now turn to wine, The master of the feast, unaware at where it came from, but based upon taste and based upon quality, thinks the bridegroom had waited all this time to bring out the the really good stuff. The bridegroom would traditionally serve the good stuff at the beginning, and then he'd bring out boxed wine after everyone's taste had been sufficiently dulled. The master of the feast is astonished that the bridegroom had reversed the usual order. But the groom had nothing to do with it. 
the narrative closes this way. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And that's how our text for the morning ends. The term sign is reference to the miracle. Here, that's an important one to note. For signs, what do they do? They point. And that is, that, that's, that's the job of a sign. In this case of a miraculous sign, it points away from itself, whatever the miracle, to the one who performed it. Which is why we read in verse 11 that the miracle manifested his glory. Verse 11, it did. The miracle showed Jesus to be divine. The disciples see what Jesus just did. He made 150 gallons of wine with no grapes, no fermentation, and did so from dirty water. No man does such. God can. Jesus is God. Recognizing this, the disciples, we are told, believed in him. And now some application. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are about 40 miracles. Not many in in John, as we'll see, but there's a few. Now, the miracles were signs that pointed back to Jesus, that he indeed was, is God. But there's something else regarding Jesus' miracles. The miracles were physical illustrations of a deeper spiritual truth, and I need to and I want to develop that. Let's take two that are coming up in John's gospel soon here and then look at the one this morning that demonstrates this. In John chapter six, the first 15 verses, we read of Jesus multiplying the five loaves and the two fish and then of course he feeds the 5,000. A few verses later in John 6, 35, Jesus refers to himself saying, I am the bread of life. Coincidental that he uses that phrase right after multiplying the bread and feeding so many? No. The miraculous physical illustration pointed to an even greater spiritual principle. In this case, it is one of Jesus' seven I am sayings that are found, as we'll find out in John. These I am statements referring to where God discloses his name to Moses way back in Exodus 3 as the great I am. So Jesus, by referring to himself as I am, seven different times in the Gospel of John is making this statement, I am God. In this case, I am the bread of life. Jesus also explains in John 6 why the bread of life phrase fits him. He came down from heaven just like manna in the wilderness, but the difference being whoever feeds on him as he will later explain to us in John 6, will never die. But it was the physical loaves and fish miracle that was used to direct the attention to this spiritual truth. In John 9, a reverse order, and this is the second one, is used. Jesus refers to himself there as, I'm the light of the world. That's verse five out of John 9. And then he uses the healing of a blind man in the next two verses, six and seven, to illustrate opening the eyes of a man born blind, to demonstrate that he indeed is the light of the world. Said another way, a miraculous sign by Jesus in the physical realm is used to illustrate an even greater redemptive truth. And that is what we have in John chapter two. Verses 1 through 11 as well, where Jesus performs his first miracle. Now, let's first recognize that by doing so at a wedding, he blesses the institution of marriage. You will often hear that. I use those words when I do weddings. And by also changing water into wine, we see that it's okay to drink the stuff. But neither of these truths are the main message of the miracle. Neither of those two, though true statements, they are not primarily the point here at all. There are some subtle yet powerful spiritual redemptive truths that are here. And in them may we see that God's plan to save his people is the thread that runs deep and runs throughout all of scripture. Jesus' opening miracle of turning water into wine is his announcement his proclamation to the world that the transformation 
of the old covenant symbolized by the stone water jars used for washing was transitioning now to the new covenant which he himself would fulfill. The old was always to be temporary. It was to always point ahead to the reality it represented. The types and shadows of the old were waiting to give way to what they represented ultimately in the new. For instance, the ceremonial washing of Exodus 30 demonstrated the need for cleanliness as the priest, representing the people before God, went before a holy God. That was the representation. For 1,500 years, the priests washed their hands. They even expanded that washing to all Israel. The ceremonial washing didn't make one spiritually clean. No, it made the point that one was spiritually dirty and needed to be made clean. It's the very opposite of what they thought they were doing. Jesus, in his opening miracle, takes those old, dirty jars of water and turns them into wine. And prophetically, the message of Isaiah chapter 25, a portion of which uh, was read by Mason, given 700 years previous, was fulfilled. Isaiah 25, on this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, darkness, sin, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken it will be said on that day here it is behold this is our God we have waited for him that he might save us this is the Lord we have waited for him let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation church Isaiah 25 is being fulfilled in John 2, 1 through 11. And students of Scripture, students who knew their Old Testament of the day should have said, there it is, he's here. He is here. Sadly, so few would. Salvation as a banquet also is a great theme of Scripture. We'll one day sit at the wedding feast of the Lamb. You and I will sit at the wedding feast of the Lamb that the book of Revelation, Revelation 19 describes the wedding of Jesus who is the bridegroom to the church, us, the bride. That's what he's going to do. In John 2, 1 through 11, the bridegroom, Jesus, comes as a guest. They run out of wine. Jesus the great bridegroom steps forward and provides the wine. And not just a little bit. No, gallons and gallons of it. And not the cheap stuff either. The very best stuff. By this miracle, Jesus is formally announcing that the bridegroom spoken of throughout the Old Testament is here. I'm here. And what a perfect place to do it. At a wedding at a wedding where they're using stone jars to wash up. They're using remnants of the old covenant. And Jesus says, get that dirty water out of here. I'm putting wine in it. You see, this is the truth. This is the wonder of this first miracle. There is so much here for us. Now, just for fun, let's peel the onion one more layer, may we? Let's look even deeper for a moment. Remember, I'm hoping that our text this morning helps us to be astonished at awe, in awe of what Jesus does and how the scriptures present him. It's often much deeper than we understand. Note in chapter one, John is big on mentioning the number of days. And I don't know if you found that odd. If you go back to John chapter one, it's this day and then the second day and then this morning we read about the third day and so forth. Is it odd for him to mention that? Or is there a purpose? John 1 covers four consecutive days. John 2 chapter 1 tells us the wedding in Cana occurs three days later. 
Stay with me here, mathematicians. So the wedding occurs on the seventh day of when John begins his story, when he begins his gospel. It is now the seventh day that he has chronicled. Let's call the seventh day what the Old Testament calls it. And we saw that as we uh, read in our statement of, uh, statement of faith in regards to uh, the fourth commandment. It's called the Sabbath. The seventh day was the Sabbath in the Old Testament. The Sabbath was given as the day of rest. In Hebrews 3, in Hebrews 4, Jesus is called what? He is called our Sabbath rest. In John 2, the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, highlighted by Jesus' first miracle, Jesus takes six jars of Jewish purification water, jars that did not and could not purify man's sin, and he transforms that dirty water into wine. And don't miss the fact there were six jars, so that we might recall the six days of creation that were followed by the seventh day of rest. I think that's a fair conclusion too. Peter Lightheart writes, Jesus takes the six water parts, water pots of Jewish purification and transforms the water into the wine of celebration on the seventh day. You see, my friends, Jesus is declaring to the world the Sabbath rest is here. The bridegroom is here. And this bridegroom does not receive gifts. No, he gives them. And he does so generously and abundantly. And that is what John 2 1 through 11 is declaring God's salvation had arrived. In an age of sound bites and Twitter or X, whatever it's called, fast food, the four spiritual laws, the seven minute devotional for busy people, and I'm going to go off on that one for 30 seconds. It is currently an ad by one of the DJs on one of the local Christian stations about how if your life's like mine, it's so busy, we don't have time, I'm going to introduce you to the seven-minute devotional Bible. There's 1,000, roughly, 500 minutes in a day, and we're going to devote seven of them to the Most High God, and then we're going to spend 1,493 any way we want. So join me, says this DJ. And I click it and I go to my 80s station and listen to, <laughs> listen to reprobates sing about love. <laughs> but at least they make me happy. <laughs> we are to have a childlike faith, but not a childlike understanding of it. In other words, we're to read John 2, 1 through 11, and just don't think it's about blessing a wedding and taking a sip of wine. For those listening who do not have saving faith, this sermon was not just, this was just as much for you as it was for someone who's been a Christian for years and years. See that Christianity is deeper, much deeper than Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Or even that Jesus died for you on the cross. In fact, it is deeper and it is more glorious the more you look. The more you read, the more you study, the more you pray, it is not a faith where you check your brain at the door. Nor is the Bible a comic book either. Something you can read and master it in seven minutes a day. It is far more than that. It is God's word. And as such, in many ways, don't you think it should be a little bit difficult to understand at a glance? He is God, we are man. He is infinite, we are finite. And to make matters difficult, there's this sin thing that's running in our veins that messes everything up. But at the same time, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's true. It is simple. The gospel message is easy to understand. God is holy. He cannot look upon sin. 
You and I, we are sinners. God will eternally punish sin. You therefore need a Savior. Jesus Christ is the only Savior. Believe in the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household, there you go. John's gospel points this out throughout his 21 chapters that are before us. Again, remember he tells us towards the end in chapter 20, why he writes, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why Jesus' first miracle was the one we read about this morning. It was this announcement. The bridegroom's here. The bridegroom has come. Come believe with us, our unbelieving friends. Come believe with us. Don't be the little boy who saw the parade and mistook it for the circus. He went home having never seen it. Don't watch the trailer and think, oh, you now have seen the movie. No, you haven't. The stakes are too high. Eternity is a long time. It's forever. You don't want to get Jesus wrong. Something many do because they think they're passing nod to him or what they heard when they were eight years old when they got drugged to church by their grandmother. That's all they needed to do to make a wise decision about their eternity. Hardly. You need to take a deeper dive. And Christian, you need to take a deeper dive. You don't know the scriptures as well as you think. You need to take a deeper look and there is so much there. That is why as the more you read it, The more you understand, the more you know. But you also have the counter to it. The more you understand, you don't know. And that will continue until glory. And the Gospel of John, it's just begun. We're only in chapter 2. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this scripture. Thank you for this miracle. Thank you for this declaration. Yep, wine, wedding, blessings. Yep, yep, and yep. But the bridegroom is here. Thank you, Lord, for fulfilling Isaiah 25. It was waiting for fulfillment. There it was. Jesus is on the scene. Father, we pray that we will see that increasingly more clearly as we work our way through this gospel. Thank you for what you have done inside of us today. In Jesus' name, amen.